Lao Bong, The Life of a Pioneer in Chinese Martial Arts. In the late 19th century, Choli Foot became the public face of the southern martial arts throughout the Pearl River Delta and much of the province. It was one of the most commercially successful schools of hand combat ever practiced in the region. It commanded the loyalty of tens of thousands of students. Through its various charitable associations and lion dance teams, it managed to extend this reach even further. Cholifoot tended to have a strong working class association in the early 20th century. It was a popular martial art among handcraft artisans, porters, sailors, and workers. The Hung Sing Association became an early supporter of the Communist Party and as a result was closed by the right-wing Nationalist Party after its purge of leftists elements in Shanghai in 1927. Most Southern martial arts schools were forced to close again with the Japanese invasion, then with the Communist victory in 1949. Needless to say, the Cultural Revolution also took a toll on the practice of all traditional martial arts in mainland China. Like Wing Chun and Hungar, Choli Foot survived the 1960s and 1970s in exile. It was practiced throughout the Chinese mass exodus in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, and even California. As a result of this highly disrupted history, many hand combat students today, both inside and outside of China, no longer understand the important role that Cholifoot played in the development of Southern China's modern martial culture. The art has yet to spawn a major media franchise, something that has benefited both Hung Gar and Wing Chun. Still, if we wish to better understand the Southern Chinese martial arts, it is necessary to take a closer look at both the legends and history that surround this style. Of course, Choli Foot is also interesting as it is one of the first Chinese martial arts to be openly taught in the United States of America in the post-World War II era. During the 19th century, different Tong, and I'll put in parentheses, the Tong is a Chinese secret society or sworn brotherhood. During the 19th century, different Tong had engaged in military training, created militias, and hired enforcers. One of the first concerted efforts at Southern martial training in the U.S. that I'm aware of occurred in 1854, in the months leading up to the Weaverville War. Still, these early experiments did not lead to long-term public instruction in the martial arts. It is also an, an interesting philosophical exercise to consider whether training with the trident and musket to fight in a battle would be considered to be an example of martial arts practice by most modern observers today. When it came to hand combat, it appears that Chinese fighters in the U.S. were just as likely to study Western boxing as anything else for the most of the late 19th and early 20th century. Lao Bon, a pioneer of the Chinese martial arts in America. Most observers of the Chinese martial arts agree that Lao Bon was the first individual to open a permanent, somewhat public, Chinese martial arts school on the American mainland. That fact alone makes him an important figure to know about. However, the details of his life are fascinating for other reasons as well, as well as illustrating many aspects of the Chinese American experience. His career demonstrates the many ways in which the martial arts intersected with and were useful to the broader political economy of immigrant communities. 
Whether it was providing physical protection, settling disputes, or creating a sense of cultural continuity, Laubon's life provides us with an interesting window into how the martial arts interacted with and were used by the broader Chinese society in the early 20th century. For that reason, I felt that a brief biographical sketch of his career would make a valuable contribution to our lives of the Chinese martial arts series. Lao Bam was born in Taishan, in Guangdong province, at the end of the Qing dynasty in 1891. Taishan is southwest of Jingmen and sits on a coastal region of the Pearl River Delta. The area is known for both its musical traditions, something that Lao Bam enjoyed and promoted throughout his life, as well as its large non-native community. The local language spoken in the region is Tashanese, a cousin of Cantonese. Large groups of Tashanese-speaking immigrants left for the American West in the middle decades of the 19th century. Some of these individuals worked for the railroad, while others took service jobs in gold mining communities or worked in San Francisco. Until very recently, Tai Chinese was the most commonly encountered dialect spoken in Chinese American communities. While the working conditions endured by these early immigrants were bleak, the wages they earned were often quite generous compared to what was being made in their home villages. Family members in America often mailed home some of their salaries as remittances which became an important source of liquidity in the local economy. Laubon was born into a family situation that was deeply dependent on the tides of the late 19th century globalization. His father worked in California and sent home the remittances that supported his mother and siblings. This source of income allowed the divided family to enjoy a comfortable standard living. For Lao Bong, this meant that his family could afford to hire martial arts teachers to instruct him. Recall that at this point, the idea of the public commercial school had not yet become standardized across the region. Accounts state that his early teachers may have exposed him to Hungar and Moltgar. Moltgar is one of the five major family styles of southern Chinese martial arts. For whatever reason, the family continued to look for a teacher and eventually settled on a well-known Choli Foot teacher named Yun Hai. Yun Hai was trained at the Hung Sing Association Hall in Foshan, northeast of Taishan. Following the death of the legendary Zhang Yim, who did much to establish Choli Foot as a major force in the Pearl River Delta region, it was at this point that Lao Bon began his studies with Yun Hai. He also is reported to have learned a shallow end five animals form from his teacher's wife, who was also an accomplished martial artist. Most accounts of Lao Bon's life are brief and do not give exact years. Still, we can make some informed guesses about when this instruction started. The Boxer Uprising in 1900 proved to be a watershed moment for martial artists across the country. Laubon studied diligently and eventually became his teacher's successor. Sometime in the 1920s, Lao Bum followed the path of so many of his countrymen before him and decided to seek his fortune in America. However, this process was vastly more complicated than it had been half a century earlier. A series of legislative acts passed between 1870 and 1924 in the United States essentially banned all legal immigration from China. In fact, in the year 1924, 
the U.S. Border Control was created under the Department of Labor. Its original task was to patrol the Mexican border. Their assignment was to find and stop Chinese immigrants who entered Mexico as part of their effort to immigrate illegally to the United States. Nevertheless, would-be Chinese immigrants did have one thing on their side. The great San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906 resulted in the destruction of most of the state's immigration records. This allowed large numbers of illegal Chinese immigrants into the U.S. to claim citizenship directly or to claim to be children of a family who were legal citizens. This was the basic situation that Lao Bon faced when he decided to immigrate. In the early 1920s, Lao Bon left China and entered Mexico, like many other immigrants of the period. After crossing the border, he became a paper son by taking on the name Wang On. As a side note, I had to look up what Paper Sun was. Paper Sun was a term coined for young Chinese males attempting to enter the United States on identity papers that were bought for them. The identity papers were established by American citizens of Chinese descent who left the U.S. to travel back to China. Upon returning, they would claim a marriage and the birth of several sons. Years later, these young Chinese males would appear claiming to be the sons of these citizens. In fact, a substantial number of these boys were sons on paper only, thus the term paper son. So La Bon had taken on the name Wang Ong, and this false identity allowed him to claim that he was the son of a legal resident. Unfortunately, there were some unanticipated complications in this plan. American law enforcement officers were well aware of these schemes and continued to work identity and deport recent Chinese immigrants. La Bon's rise to fame actually started in 1930 when he got in an altercation with a group of immigration officials in Los Angeles. After fleeing from a regular police officer who tried to detain him, he found himself cornered in a building by a number of immigration officials who had arrived as backup. He fought with and successfully resisted four or five of these officers before jumping safely from a second-story window and making his getaway. News of Lao Bun's adventure and successful confrontation with the immigration authorities spread quickly in the still relatively small Chinese-American community. When he arrived in San Francisco in 1931, his reputation assured him a hearty welcome from the powerful Hop Sing Tong. He was hired to act as a guard or bouncer for various nightclubs and gambling houses, and at some point during the 1930s, he established the Wa Kong Kung Fu Club of Choli Foot. This was a small private school. Its original purpose was only to teach the martial arts to a group of younger members of the Hop Sing Tong, remembering Tong means brotherhood, who would likely also have gone on to work in the local communities as guards or bouncers. However, as Law Bond's stature in the community grew, there was more interest in his martial arts background and his understanding of traditional Chinese medicine, both herbalism and bone setting. His school expanded and eventually evolved into the Hong Sing Studio of San Francisco. By the early 1950s, there was no longer a functioning Hong Sing school in Foshan, and so Lao Bon's lineage took on added importance. The new school quickly became heavily involved in community affairs. Lao Bon enjoyed traditional music and he trained a lion dance society. He provided traditional medical treatments to members of the local community and was occasionally looked to as a broker or go-between to settle disputes. Lao Bon also was engaged in extensive fundraising, which sometimes included public kung fu displays 
which was a rarity at the time, for the Chinese hospital in San Francisco. During the 1930s, the demand for Kung Fu instruction, even within the Chinese American community, was quite slim. However, as servicemen returned from fighting in the Pacific in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, interest in the martial arts increased. Some of this curiosity began to be directed at the Chinese fighting arts starting in the late 1950s and the late 1960s, thanks to the Bruce Lee phenomenon. What started as a trickle had become a flood of outside interest. Lao Bun's career is interesting precisely because it spans two eras. When he first arrived, dominant white society had adopted a stance of active hostility toward Asian Americans. Lao Bun was fiercely loyal to his community and drawing on the tradition of the Foshan Hung Sing Association, which was famous in the 19th century for its three exclusions policy, refused to teach Kung Fu to non-Chinese individuals. Still, given the active hostilities between these communities and the general lack of knowledge that the Chinese fighting arts even existed, one suspects that the beatniks from San Francisco were not exactly knocking down the door of the Kung Fu Club demanding instruction. As a note, beatnik was a media stereotype in the 1950s to 60s that displayed the more superficial aspects of the beat generation literary movement of the 1950s. In the late 1950s and 60s, things were different. Lao Bon was now in his 70s. Both his reputation and school were well established. The yellow peril that had dominated the 20s and 30s had all but disappeared from the public discourse. In some ways, community relations were much freer than they had ever been in the past. And now, a new generation of young adults actually was banging on the door of the Hong Sing Association asking to be admitted as students. Bing Chong was the first of the San Francisco instructors trained by Lao Bong to begin openly admit non-Chinese students to his classes. Zhu Long, who was Lao Bong's actual successor, also began to work with Caucasian students at almost exactly the same time. Students of Choli Foot and martial historians are lucky to have some home movies shot at a public demonstration, probably sometime in the early 1960s. The atmosphere in these films is festive. They record Lao Bum performing a butterfly sword routine, which is probably the earliest footage of butterfly swords being used in America that I have seen. A wide variety of other demonstrations also were performed by second and third generation students. It is interesting to note that not all the students are Chinese. Larry Johnson, a student of Julong, can clearly be seen demonstrating the Tiger Fork in one section of the film. So while Lao Bong never taught any non-Chinese students as a younger man, he clearly suffered racism at the hands of the dominant social group. By the 1960s, he was happily presiding over what had become an open and multiracial school. In fact, Lao Bong is often credited as having introduced Anthony Quinn, an important Mexican-American actor, to Kung Fu. These short films are worth watching as they record a critical moment in the emergence of the Chinese martial arts in America. In conclusion, determining who first accomplished some feat is usually a difficult and thankless task. There are suggestions that Western police officers in Shanghai in the 1920s studied Chinese boxing, and it is well known that a wide variety of martial arts were openly taught to Westerners in Taiwan from 1949 to the present. Still, I find it remarkable 
that it took as long as it did to establish permanent Chinese martial arts schools in the U.S. Lao Ban opened the first known school, and his students were among the first individuals to openly teach the Chinese martial arts to all races in the U.S. Nevertheless, it would be a mistake to reduce his life to a series of first or colorful anecdotes. I prefer to focus on the ways that his biography demonstrates how the martial arts interacted with other elements of Chinese society, both in Guangdong and throughout the diaspora. His life experience points to the importance of globalization as a central force in the social destiny of both southern China and the Chinese martial arts. Further, I find it fascinating that within his lifetime, the martial arts were used both as a tool to police the boundaries between communities and as a doorway to bridge them. That is a valuable lesson to remember as we think about the shifting relationships between the Chinese martial arts, identity, and nationalism today. If you were looking for a figure to act as the foundation for a major martial arts film franchise, Lao Bun's life would provide plenty of material. If instead you are interested in the development of modern Chinese martial arts culture, his biography would also make for an interesting reading. I hope that this brief sketch inspires other academic students to start to investigate and write about the history of Choli Foot and its leading figures both inside and outside of China.